Nothing is ordinary. No one is in it. Jason is back. But something is coming to get them. Welcome again to The Hysteria Continues. Uh, This is um, podcast number two, and it wasn't so terrible that it was only podcast um, numero uno, so we're back for a second helping. So uh, thank you to everyone who listened to the last one, uh, and uh, thank you for coming back. Um, I'm joined again by Joseph, the head honcho for The Body Code Continues. I don't want to be here today. (laughs) You don't want to be here today? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay, cool. All right. (laughs) Um, And also Eric from Dublin. Hello. Hi, Eric. Um, and I'm, of course, Justin from uh, the Hysteria Lives Continues. I'm going to get confused with those two. Um, so I knew this was a bad idea, naming it the Hysteria Continues. I know, I know. But anyway, <laughs> I think this is all going to go perfectly, because the last one actually turned out pretty well, didn't it, guys? Do you, do you agree? Yeah, not too bad, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, I so- still don't think it represents my voice fully, but... Well, yeah. I think Joseph has the same issue. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> yeah, get past that. We'll get past that. And I had noticed on the uh, obviously the body count continues forums, people have been asking for a shout shout out. So uh, we might do a few of those later. We shall see um, and actually find out who's actually listening and pretending to listen. So, um, but I do um, have one. I'm going to the uh, end of the show if that's all right, though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, what we're going to talk about um, today is we've got um, we've got top five list again. We're going to talk about the worst slasher movies, um, uh, and um, some of those. Well, the thing about slasher movies, a lot of them are bad but very enjoyable. But these are actually going to be the ones that are, how can we put it, awful and all just awful basically. So, <laughs> um, but then we're going to be talking about a, a film coming up later. Um, the initiation, uh, which is one we kind of chose together because it's one we all enjoy. Um, and it's cheesy and good. So, um, we're going to be talking about that, but I think we're going to start off, aren't we, by talking a little bit about the current state of, um, slasherdom. And of course this podcast is all about the slasher movie. Um, I don't think there is another, um, slasher movie podcast out there at all that as far as I'm aware, uh, we're number one, baby. We're number one, we're number one. Yeah. We're leading the way with, um, with retro slasher flicks. So, um, so shall I ask Joseph, what's your view? What do you think of this, the current, uh, state of slasherdom? Well, um, I think, my main problem with slashers today are the characters. I mean, you know, back in the 80s and the 70s, you had all these genial characters who, you know, were likable. And today it's like a bunch of foul-mouthed children uh, who are selfish and only looking out for number one, you know, would push someone down to get away from the killer. It's just, it's really hard to identify with a lot of the slasher films today when, I mean, when you have to look at characters who are just, truly despicable so yeah no i'd agree with how about you eric yeah i think that's really really true especially of the friday the 13th remake which i found was populated with the most horrible individuals but sorry joseph yeah Mm -hmm. (laughs) there are a few films that use like despicable characters well there's one that came out um i don't know how i'm pronouncing this right but it's a ray well watching massacre have you seen that oh yeah yeah now this movie has like really despicable characters, but it like it puts a real a real good twist on them. Like for instance, like you don't know who's going to be the 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 last person standing, and the last person standing is totally despicable. But they have this like undercurrent of like humor to it. It's just you know if they do stuff like that, it's okay. But you know most of the time, it's like characters you just you want to see die within the first five minutes. I think I think that's um, a really good point. I mean, what we've seen, I, well, at least for me, is in the last uh, five ten years, is the, the the better slasher movies coming from um, countries that aren't traditionally known for slasher movies, such as France. And I mean, with the Reykjavik, we're watching massacre is from Iceland, which I don't know of them doing any kind of slasher movies at all. 
Um, and you got them working from Korea, South Korea and Japan and all sorts of different places. Um, but I agree with you, Joseph, and you, Eric. I mean, the thing that really I find um, a real shame about the modern slasher movie, a lot of them, not all of them, um, is a complete lack of um, characters to empathise with. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about, I'm sure some of these are going to come out onto our worst slasher list. And I've, I've certainly tried not to do just all... Um, modern slashers because there's a few real stinkers back in the 80s as well which we're going to be talking about but um, I, I find it you know films where the um, uh, the cast just looks like they're from the OC they're not really into it there's no there's no kind of passion and there's no fun to them I think one of the worst ones which actually isn't on my list but I it probably should have done was the train um, what was ostensibly the terror train remake um, which is train with Thora Birch have either of you seen that no, I never got around to us. So. No, no, I have really, I have no real interest in checking no. that out. I mean, I'm glad actually it didn't become the Ter Train re- remake because it's essentially it's hostile on a train. Um, but all the characters, including Thora Birch, who's ostensibly the final girl, is is just completely unlikable and just just a real pain in the ass, and you just want her to die. Um, and that's not the case with um, a lot of the classic era slash movies. Certainly with the um, with the final girls, with someone like Amy Steele or or certainly Jamie Lee Curtis, you wanted them to live. You were cheering them on. Whereas something like Train, you want her to be you know run over by the train within the first five minutes. Which <laughs> well, is, if you notice that um, you know like a lot of old slasher films, like uh, you know My Bloody Valentine, they're populated with a lot of people who are like working class, and you can identify with them. And you know today it's like. People from like Jersey Shore, you know, they put more gel in their hair than they do, you know, talking about human interests and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, absolutely. What What do you think, Eric? Is I mean, what's your you know your views on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I blame you have to blame Scream for all that type of stuff. They were the first to bring in the sort of airbrush teenagers from the television and put them onto the, into the slasher movie. Um, the modern ones. Uh, the only ones I tend to see are the ones that get released theatrically, which probably are the worst ones. I mean, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake was abysmal. Not as bad as the Halloween remake. Friday the 13th remake, I wasn't mad on either. Um, one of the most recent ones, it's, it was billed as a slasher. I still don't class it as one myself, but I really, really liked um, Death Proof, Quentin Tarantino's okay. movie. Yeah. I thought that was particularly good. and it, it, I mean, it had slasher-type characters in it, even if it wasn't a sort of slasher-type movie itself. Um, you were saying the best ones are coming from abroad. I mean, the, the two Cold Prey films from, is it is it Norway or Sweden it's, it's they are from? Yeah. Um, they're particularly strong, I thought. Um, I mean, I know you like them as well, Justin. You give them quite uh, glowing reviews on the site. Um, the Descent was another one I really liked recently. Mm-hmm. Again, it's dubious as to whether it's a slasher movie. I'm just throwing it in there because you have it included on the Hysteria Lives site. Mm-hmm. But um, for the major- majority of them are weak remakes or uh, originals filled with, as Joseph says, you know, obnoxious characters. And also there's the Saw series, which... Uh, again, I'm not sure if that class is a slasher movie. What What do you think, Justin? Uh, uh, parts three to six, I thought were crap, so I, I didn't bother going back for the last one last October. To be honest, I with with Saw, I, I really enjoyed the first one. I thought it was a uh, you know creepy and fun and nasty and oh, lots of good stuff. But um, I saw the second one. I thought it was a piece of crap. To be honest, did and you? I, I quite like the second one. I have to say. Well, I thought if, if reading from what everyone else said that after the second one and third one were okay, and there's a, a few, maybe one of the later ones was was a bit of a you know a pearl in shit, but the rest of it was um, I just couldn't be bothered. It's it's again with the Nightmare on Elm Street um, remake, I I just couldn't bring myself to watch it. I almost have like a, a, some kind of allergic reaction. Uh, I was sitting there thinking, will I watch this? And I just thought, you know, I remember seeing the first Nightmare on Elm Street back at the cinema in 1985. <laughs> Oh, you're not that old, surely. I am, unfortunately. I was 16 when I saw it, so that gives you a clue of my age. Yeah. But um, I'd snuck into um, to, to an 18 film then. But I, you know, it it feels like it's sully, sullying it, and it will, you know, by watching that. And I just don't really want to do that. So, um, but yeah, it's. I think it's kind of brings us on. I think this is something we're going to return to time and time again. But um, unless you've got anything else you want to say about, it, I mean, should we just sort of dive into our worst slashers? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm good to go. You're good to go. Um, yep. Do you want to? Do you want to go first, Eric? Okay. Um, you were saying that most of yours are for um, the modern era. I chose most of mine from the uh, classic era, mainly because I haven't seen a huge amount of the modern stuff. So I feel kind of bad for naming these ones because there are elements to them I enjoy. 
But uh, my number five is going to have to be the classic Savage Water from 1978. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It's a film that works, I think, is really great for a laugh in small bite-sized chunks. Watching it in a 90-minute hole is quite grueling and, you know, it, it tests your patience. It's, I mean, it's lots of people in ill-fitting hot pants going around pointing at things that the camera doesn't <laughs> show you. Um, you've got... See, you got this endless sequence of somebody going into a makeshift toilet and other people wanting to use it and they can't. And it, they're just obviously using up time. There's scenes where people are obviously fluffing their lines. Uh, they stumble over the sentence and go back to the start. And, you know, they obviously didn't have the budget to go for a retake. It's, um, it's insanely inept. But, you know, you have to admire them for, you know, getting off their asses and doing it. And as I said... There's lots of fun to be had if you watch tiny fragments of it at a time, but not as a whole chunk. I would I would agree with that. How about you, Joseph? Uh, are we talking about my number five, or am I just talking about, about Savage, Savage Water? Water? I mean, unless you unless it's going to um, appear in your in oh, your it's list. in my list. It's not number five, but uh, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> really really terrible. It's just yeah. I mean, if you want one to, of the worst, um, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Obviously. Absolutely. I mean, if you want to hold off on it until you you come to it, if you want to say, so, yeah, yeah, I I'll, think we are going to we are going to sort of um, overlap with some of our things. So certainly, yeah. a certain film by a certain um, Mr. Zombie might be up there at the top. <laughs> just so, might. <laughs> just might be up there at the top. Um, There's a chance. But but Savage Water for me is kind of it was a bit of a holy grail. I found it at Boot Fair, which um, in in British um, parlance, I mean that's kind of I think like a I don't know if you have them in America, but like a yard sale um, where everyone gets on a Sunday and throws open their boots and tries to sell all their crap. And one of the biggest pieces of crap there was Savage Water. Now surprisingly, it's not on my list. Um, but it, I, all I know about Savage Water is it's kind of one of the first slash movies made in 1978, obviously, before Halloween. Um, but it was so bad that it's never, ever, as far as I'm aware, got... It certainly didn't get a cinematic release in America. And I'm right in thinking, am I, um, Joseph, it never got a release um, uh, on tape? No, uh, there was... Uh, I spoke with Joe Bob Briggs once about it, and... Mm. Um, he said, I don't remember the country, but basically some guy, you know, got a station wagon and had two people, he put a raft on top of the station wagon and he had two people struggling to sell the movie in some third world country. And someone saw it and said, hey, you know, I own a theater, I want to screen this here. I, you know, I liked your publicity stunt. So I think they screened it for like three people and those three people probably walked out. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, it got... It, I mean, it took me forever to find a copy, and the copy I found was a PAL tape from the United Kingdom, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is a certainly, pretty... Certainly not released in America. No. no not surprised. Not surprised. So, as, as they say, as I've found my cost so many times before, chasing that Holy Grail, part of the fun is in the chase. Sometimes um, over the rainbow is a big pile of steaming crap, basically, and unfortunately, <laughs> that's one of them. How about you, Joseph? What's your number five? All right, well, I have to send my apologies to a forum member named BTK, but my number five is a movie from 2000 called Bloody Murder. Mm. Uh, it's bad enough that the creators behind it, they couldn't really be bothered to pick a different mask for its killer. You know, it kind of looks like Jason Voorhees. But <laughs> they litter the movie with, like, some of the most bland, sub monotone actors this side of a high school rendition of death of a salesman mm. and they have like you know lengthy conversations about guam cigarettes and ritz crackers and yeah it's just something i wouldn't wish upon anyone even my worst enemies and i still love you david uh btk i'm sorry i had to pick that one but i had to it's, it's I've, have you seen it eric i happen to know no, no i have i have seen it but it's one of those films that is probably so bad that i don't remember very much about it at all um, apart from it, is, it was very bland, which is probably why I don't um, remember anything about it at all. And I think um, actually some of the worst slasher movies, and there's one, it's a couple on my list, are ones that are so inoffensive or so blah that they're not offensive, they're not good, they're not bad, they're just there. Um, and I think the wor one of the worst crimes for a slasher movie is to be boring. Um, and it certainly sounds sounds like that one. Has you got anything else you want to purge on Bloody Bloody Murder? Uh, I think I've covered it. It's just, I, it goes back to, you know, having obnoxious characters, people you cannot identify with, and it's just it's just awful. That's all I can say about it. It's awful. And I have to send my apologies to BTK once more because I know he loves this movie. I don't know why, but he does. 
at the end of the day, um, if we all loved the same things, it'll be, you know, it'd be a very boring world. But then you have to wonder why some people like films like that. But apologies to BTK. And I'm sure he'll have a hard on by hearing us talking about him. So I'm sure that'll make up for it. So um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I offend so. a few more people before this list is out. Um, I doubt many people would be offended by my f- number five because, um, again, it's, it's, it's rare as hen's teeth. Um, but this kind of comes back to um, the beginning of the um, the video era, um, and it's the old punky um, ethos of um, anyone can do it. So basically, if people took video cameras, anyone could do it. And of course, the bad news is not everyone can do it well. Um, and for every John Carpenter, there were a million sort of um, Rob Zombies. Oh dear, let's let that out before cut out the bag before I meant to. But anyway. Um, Spine from 1986 is an incredibly rare uh, slasher movie, and I say it's barely a slasher movie. I mean, it's 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 pretty dreadful. Um, uh, if you don't know it, um, it has uh, a man who's after a woman called Linda, who calls every woman Linda. He looks like the man from The Joy of Sex, and if you if you remember that, or you may not, but he's he's <laughs> a, the guy with a beard. No offense, yes. Eric, but he's kind of. He's also got, for some bizarre reason, he's got a missing eye, right eye, and it looks like he's got a pocket arsehole as, as his right <laughs> eye socket. And what he does, he slashes up nurses, and he cuts them so badly that they reveals their spine. Now, um, that sounds pretty horrible, but it's so inept, it's so boring, and it's so it's just so inept that it's not sleazy enough to be offensive and not bad enough to be enjoyable. Um, and I think, although it is incredibly rare, there is a reason, again, like with Savage Water, why it's so rare. And it's because it's so bloody awful. Um, and not bloody awful in a good way. And this is where, it, we, we, you know, we may, next time we do this, actually talk about the worst slash movies that are really entertaining. We'll, we'll decide what we're going to do. But this is one of those films, you just sit there, and it drains all joy out of your life. Um, so if you haven't <laughs> seen it, don't. So, well, um, so I, I have seen it, believe it or not. You have. I have too. I, it's terrible. It, it's um, <laughs> it's shot on video, and uh, it's kind of ha- it has these weird zooms, which is almost like it's a hidden um, documentary crew, which gives it this weird ambience, and then all these bad actors come into it. And it, it, am I right in saying that about half of it is a dream sequence? I, I, I'm not sure. I think so. I mean, it's, it's got yeah. some it's of the It's incredibly worst. short, I remember, yeah, thankfully. Yeah. But still, it comes... still feels like you've wasted a year of your life watching it. Yeah, it's, it's, I, uh, some of these films, I kind of look back at the reviews of it and I think, and I don't actually remember watching it, and I know I must have watched it, and maybe I was drunk. Mm. I mean, I don't know. That's very possible. But with this film, it was kind of those films that were so inoffensive, so boring, so mm. blah, that I just kind of, you know... I, it, it, I, I find it hard to get into a film that is that has that shot-on-video look. Yeah. I don't mind cheap films as long as they have a kind of, you know, a film-like quality. But when they're shot on video, it, it, like my, my interest drops at the instant, you know, I press play. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, okay, well, that's my number five. Um, there's a lot more crud to come. So um, who's next? Is it Eric or it's Joseph? It's me, yes. Okay, your number My number four, four is uh, a film I really should like because, as you know, I'm obsessed with the 80s. I'm obsessed with big hair, leg warmers, cheesy new wave music. So I don't know why I don't like this film. It's called Fatal Pulse mm. from 1988. Yeah. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> it has a score that's, that has, it has this big twangy uh, slap bass uh, music to it. It sounds like this is, this is a studio by by Phil Collins. <laughs> the, the acting is dreadful. Not as bad as Savage Water, and not as bad as another film I've got later in my list. But uh, you know, it's it's up there with sort of bad acting. If the film is just so and completely boring, apart from one sequence where a woman gets her throat slit with a vinyl record, mm. and for younger folk, a vinyl record is what we used to listen to before CD was invented. Mm. Um, and then there's this character in it, this sort of fat character who wears back to front baseball cap and plays video games. And every time he comes on the screen, the soundtrack goes boing. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose that that bit is kind of fun, but uh, it's not enough to worth to, not enough to sort of be worth hunting down the film and sitting there for ninety minutes watching it. It kind of reminded me just enough that Jan Terry video you sent me. Oh yes. Uh, if anyone doesn't know who Jan Terry is, I recommend you look her up on YouTube. Uh, very much so I can imagine she would be in that film in spandex bending over um, ooh, ooh. It, it, nasty be nasty be nasty <laughs> 
Just a, just a little fun factoid. Um, I must admit, I mean, I, I saw the film not that long ago, and I um, I've been putting off because I got it's got the most fantastic artwork on the cover. It's got that um, which I think I used on the front of Hysteria Live for a while, um, which has got the um, or maybe it's still up there. But anyway, it's the the one with the woman, the blonde hair with the the black glove over her mouth. Um, yeah, that's, that's, the, the, that's what you have up at the moment. I'm just yeah, looking at sorry. it now. But that's that's from the I think it's the Australian um, VHS that I had. But also, fun factoid: I am proud owner of a Japanese um, poster of this film. Why I, don't, I just got it as a job lot, some other things. It was released in Japan as Rosemary's Killer Two, so oh, it was a sequel to Prowler. So uh, can you imagine if you'd watched the Prowler and you thought, "Hooray! It's a sequel to the Prowler," and then you got um, <laughs> boy, yeah. many, many, Spandex. many apologies to Joseph Zito. So. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Um, Can I just clarify, uh, Justin? I've just had a look on your site, and it's not it's not your front um, page artwork. Sorry, my uh, mistake. Yeah, no, I thought it was the older one. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that is a is a worthy um, number four. Um, I yeah. mean, we'll be getting through to our number two soon. But uh, Joseph, what's your number four? Uh, I see what you did there. Uh, very clever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Savage Sa- Water again. Yes. Yes, Savage Water. Uh, okay. Uh, I think we've covered this, but you know, it, it looks like the cast was round up from you know the Mexican border. Uh, is filmed through like a muddy kaleidoscope kind of, kind of camera, and I don't know what else I can say since we've already covered it. But uh, you There's know, it's a great bit of dialogue about karma or something. Yeah, that, uh, that goes on forever, and uh, it's obviously doctor, padding. The doctor character's talking about how he wants to push himself over the edge to see if he could murder someone, yeah. which was a big red herring, but. Uh, <laughs> They just do it in the most uh, abysmal way. And I, I want to just kind of uh, throw out a little bit of hatred towards uh, Doe Bob Briggs because if he he would never have mentioned it in an article I read. I probably never would have seen the movie. So uh, everything about this movie can be blamed, put on his shoulders. So I hate you, Joe Bob. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, the thing that gets me about this film, it's got, it's got like, it's um, like some old Cecil D. Mill film from the 19, well, you know, from the early part of the 20th century with a cast of not thousands, but certainly dozens of people. Um, and, you know, never in the history of cinema is so, so, such little amount of talent being gathered with so many people in one place. And it's, it's a bizarre, bizarre sort of um, bizarre film, and um, it's a worthy inclusion on our top five crud list. So you know, another thing about this movie is um, the the scenery is not too bad, but they even managed to film in like some of the muddiest water. I mean, they couldn't even find clear water. I mean, mm. everything looks just so damp and abysmal mm. and dirty. It just it's just really crappy. And also the other thing is they don't, you know, that many people, they only kill what is a, you know, a handful of people, don't they? So there's course, like 50 people in the cast already. I know. And the first one is killed and like they're traumatized for about 10 seconds. And then they all go around and sit around a campfire and sing some horrible song. <laughs> I know, I know. It reminds me of that um, fantastic, just getting off the subject, was the same kind of thing of, in slasher movies where the plot keeps on grinding on because they have to do it. They can't, you know, in, in a normal um, life, if someone was murdered, people would run screaming for the hills, straight for the authorities, said, everyone get out of here. And one of my favourite bad jallows is um, Eyeball and the Bertie yes. Lindsay one, uh, where, they're, where, where they're on that, um, I'm sure we'll talk about it at some point, but we're on that holiday in Spain, the bus holiday, and they get one by one, they're being murdered, but they carry on with their bus holiday, which is <laughs> absolutely fantastic. So it's a bit like this. Um, yeah, it's absolutely awful film. So, so um, on to my number five. It's another, I'm going to come on to some slightly better known ones, but it's another one that's not very well known. Uh, number four. Number, oh, number four. four, sorry. Number four. <laughs> is, um, is, and it's not well known, again, for all the right reasons. Um, it's a Canadian slasher movie. I kind of guess it is a slasher movie called Skullduggery. Now, it must have been back in the early 80s. It was a good idea to uh, mix Dungeon Dragons role-playing with the idea of a slasher film. And the actual, the, the idea behind it's not too bad, whereas you have an obsessed teen who gets together with his friends, plays Dungeons & Dragons, and the consequences in the game, he carries them out in real life. So people start dying. Um, so it, was, it sounds like it's a good, good idea, and it was a good idea, but it is, again, it's so joylessly done. The, um, the lead character has all the personality of cancer, um, and it's, well, he does. It's just hideous. It's, it's mired in faux mysticism. Doesn't make any sense. 
Although it has got one great what the fuck moment, looking back to last week, where a character's running through a graveyard, trips, looks through a window into a church, and there's someone dressed as Liberace in a, in a red sequin jacket, hammering away a tune on the piano. Um, <laughs> so for that alone, it's, it has some good things, but it's, it's, it is a joyless experience. And again, that's the reason why it kind of makes one of my, my top um, five crap lists, is because it is actually a very, very boring, dull film which is very muddled um has no coherency at all um yeah have you really seen it no haven't seen it it's been a long time Uh, the the one thing i remember is the liberace scene Uh, um you can't yeah you're right it's it's a bad movie um i think it's cardinal sin is just that you know it's put together well but it's just very very boring yeah yeah exactly i mean this is i think this is actually the um the thing with our list is actually it's boring films that's they can mm. be offensive, they can be um, bloody, they can be campy, they can be cheesy. But if they're boring, that's when it, you know, that, I think that's the, the cardinal sin for a slash movie. Okay, well, what's, um, what's our number three? Number three for me is uh, a film you intru- introduced me to, uh, Justin, actually. It's uh, from 1989, it's Australian, it's called Houseboat Horror. Oh, yes. And it, it, this is another one uh, that's very much shot on video, and boy, does it look it. It looks like it was shot with the most inexpensive home video camcorder equipment they could get their hands on. Um, it's have you, uh, have you seen it, Joseph? Houseboat yes, Horror? And I, yeah, it has yes. about it has about 30 characters in it. It has it's just it's crammed with too many characters, and they, they keep getting killed off before you have a chance to even know what their names are. Uh, it's got this crazy the premise is this rock band goes out to a houseboat to make a video and um they're the most over the top uh cliched uh spinal tap type band and wait until you hear their song i mean it's got something called young and groovy <laughs> Oh, yeah, I do. Can you remember it? Um, now, the only the only um, bonus for certainly for us over here in Europe, you mightn't get this reference. Joseph is that with the lead one of the lead actors in it is was famous for being in the soap opera Neighbours, where he played sort of goody two shoes Justin uh, Justin Priestley. I was going to say Jason Priestley type character, and uh, he ends up uh, swearing. You see him in bed with a woman, and then he gets his head split in two with a machete, which. Uh, What's, a, what's the only sort of bonus to watching this film? Well, the only thing I remember, I've chose to block the movie out, but the only thing I remember is that it had um, Alan Dale in it, and he went that's, on... That's the guy, that's Alan the guy, Dale. That's yeah. the guy, yeah. Is that the, is that the same guy? It, it is. is. Yeah, now, yeah. He's famous now, he, and he's respected yeah, he now. Went on, in, yeah. He went on to play uh, Charles Widmore on the show Lost. And he was so, in 24, you know, and he was yeah, in Star, Star Trek Nemesis, he was in as well. He's, yeah, he's made How a, a good career escape? for himself. How did he escape with his dignity intact? I don't know. I have no, I have no idea. I don't think, I think he did escape. I think this... He didn't escape with his dignity. His dignity <laughs> is left on a houseboat somewhere in the arse end of Australia, I think. I'm not sure this got released outside Australia, did it? I don't think they would let it through customs anywhere else. I think it was so bad, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. It was awful, awful film. Because, um, yeah, because Neighbours is um, it's still going. I mean, you, you probably luckily don't have it in America, but it's an Australian saccharine sweet. Actually, you like it, Eric, don't you? You outed me. I, I you outed me to last week as America's yeah. top model. Um, Kylie Minogue used to be in it, Joseph. If that's if you know who she is. Yeah, I know who she is. Yeah, um, and it was. I mean, it's very much of its time. But oh, houseboat horror, dear oh dear oh dear. It's it's a was good, it was good to see him being but, having his head split open with a machete because that kind of that yeah, did, but uh, it, make it up comes for, quite near the end, and you've got a lot of yeah. dreck to stri- sit through to get to that point. <laughs> Absolutely. And there, is, may, there is some fantastic mullets in it, though, I'll say that much. There, it would have been better called the Mullet Houseboat Massacre, wouldn't it? That would have been more, yes. more telling, yes. I think so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, what's your, well, we're number three, aren't we? What's yours, Joseph? Okay, uh, my number three is from 2003. It's called Detour. Uh, okay. Okay, it's basically the hills have eyes. It's kind of one of those variations, you know, people in an RV go out, cannibals try to kill them. But it makes the dreadful, dreadful mistake of having a character who's white, who thinks he's the reincarnation of Tupac Shakur, but they also have the gall to make him the hero so he doesn't die. So he spends the whole movie, you know, acting like Eminem on steroids, and he screams, and he yells, and he's obnoxious, and I just wanted to choke the life out of him, and he turns out to be the hero, and he saves the day, and the movie goes off, and I've wipe pretty much everything else from my memory and I don't ever want to talk about it again so let's move on I haven't seen it have you Eric 
I did see it, uh, but at the time it was released, and I have absolutely no recollection of it. Um, I remember a friend recommending it to me, and he said, excitedly, let's watch it together. So we sat down to watch it. He was laughing and was screaming all the way through it, thinking it was brilliant. And I, my jaw was on the ground going, oh, my God, this is one of the most boring <laughs> films I've ever seen. And I haven't spoken to him ever since. Uh, it sounds yeah, it's very very canny on your part, Eric. I haven't, yes. I haven't seen it. It's not something I've heard of it, but it sounds like I dodged a bullet there. So um, you know, thanks for warning. And hopefully, anyone is listening now. We're doing you a ser- service here. Uh, remember, we watch them, so you don't have to. But I know you probably will anyway. But um, um, we're masochists like that. Ex- exactly, exactly. Um, my talking of masochism. Um, my number three <laughs> oh, here we go. is my. Yeah, last... it's, it's just a Spanish supermarket story again. No, no, no. It's not no, a Spanish no. supermarket story. <laughs> um, but this is my last of the eighties ones. We'll be moving on to slightly uh, newer slasher movies in a minute. But um, is a, a trauma movie. Now I'm not sure if it. And I think it was originally a trauma movie. It's Splatter University. Now, I really, really hated this film because I, for a long time, I wanted to see it because I think I saw a still, um, a really gory still of someone. Um, I think it was a co-ed lying with her with her guts spilled out um, in, a, in a magazine for years and years back in the eighties, and I thought, oh, that looks really scary and gory and should be really good. Um, but what it turned out was um, uh, before I knew about trauma, and I have to say, I'm not a fan of trauma. Uh, there's a few things I've liked over the years. Uh, you know, Mother's Day is a pretty good film, but it's not really a trauma film. Um, but um, Splatter University is the worst kind of slasher movie to me. Um, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's released in two, eight, 1984, and apparently went out to. It was shown at the cinema. I've, I've actually got the the one sheet around somewhere. Um, it was released with 200 prints, so it went out to 200 cinemas uh, back in 1984 in the, in the states. What anyone who watched it would have thought. I mean, it's 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 got goriness and um, cheesiness, but it's so forced. It's kind of forced wackiness, faux outrageousness, um, and basically, it's got characters um, that you you just don't like. And the one single character you do like dies horribly. Um, it's just got it's just um, uh, thrill free. Uh, really, I just found it unpleasant, boring, and. Um, you know, basically the antithesis of everything I liked about slasher movies. Uh, so there you go. That's uh, Splatter University for me. How about you guys? You've seen it. I you have. Know, um, yeah. I I don't hate the movie, but I don't really like it. You know, I have a friend who worships the ground it walked on, thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, have they been I think my I think my problem with the movie is, you know, like you said, all the – obnoxious characters you know pretty much live and the one character that you really want to actually make it to the end dies horribly and it's just really mean-spirited and it's just not something i'd you know want to watch over and over but it does have some you know funny moments i'll give it that it might be something i'll come back to at some point but again it's it's something i'm in no rush to see again how about you eric have you seen it i haven't seen that one no no no, no. Well, you t- do yourself a favor i, I do hate that. i like you I, I just can't stand trauma films um the, the the stuff that's sort of typical of trauma you know mother's day is a good film but uh you know things like class of newcomb high i can live without it's it's funny isn't it for for us well i don't know about um not speaking for you joseph but for us who you know who love kind of cheesy horror movies and trauma should be the the pinnacle of that or you know the low point of the high i think point, the right point is that they um deliberately go out of the way to be as cheesy and stupid as possible whereas the ones that we really like that isn't their always their goal that's what i was going to say you know a lot of the movies that I like, they're cheesy, you know, for the wrong reasons, and they don't mean to be. In trauma, you know, they go out and, you know, I'm going to be deliberately cheesy, and I just don't think that really works when you're trying. Mm-hmm. When you don't try and it just happens accidentally, that's when it, you strike gold. Yeah, I think. absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think we're, we're coming up to um, the top two of, of CRUD. Um, we are about to launch our number twos, and not in a Spanish supermarket style way. But, um, okay, who's going to go first with a number two? I'll go first with my number two. Okay. (laughs) Uh, This is one of the first films I ever reviewed for Hysteria Lives, actually. It's a film called Terror at Ten Killer. Mm. And uh, it starts with the words, United Entertainment presents Terror at Ten Killer. And I find two things wrong with that statement. One is entertainment, one is terror. (laughs) This is easily, uh, well, I know I have another film to go but this is easily possibly the most boring film I've ever had to sit through it's it's got bad acting nothing happens in it there's I think there's you see one sort of 
bit of tiny bit of action uh, towards the end where the really annoying lead actress finally gets her due. Um, sound quality is really bad. It reminds me of uh, you've seen Birdemic. It's oh, yeah. like the sound quality in that where as the camera changes the shot, the, the ambient noise in the background changes as well with it. So it's obviously done uh, sort of on the cheap. Although I have to say I did like the lead actress who looks like Olivia Newton-John. She wears a, a dress that looks like her mother's best floral tablecloth for the first half of the film. <laughs> and that was the highlight for me. And I mean, if that's the highlight, that's saying something. And the, the music was done on the cheapest keyboard, Bon Tempe Casio thing you could possibly imagine. Horrible, absolutely horrible. Have you seen it's it? It's dreadful. It's dreadful. I I have seen it, and um, again, it's one of those films that I've got barely any recollection of at all. But apart from it, it was, you know, I'll never go back near it again. Um, and you're thinking, you think when they when they put these films together, and they must have thought, you know, what kind of film were they thinking they're going to make? You know, when you're making a slasher movie or a thriller or a horror movie or anything, you know, within any kind of realm of of the thriller slasher horror genre, you think you've got to make it try making it exciting um, I mean a film like Nailgun Massacre which is very cheesy and entertaining it's certainly not scary but at least they're attempting to make mm. it scary whereas a film like Terror at Tenkiller it's almost they, they're they so bored by it and if they're bored by it we're going to be bored by it um, and I think I think you know, uh, there's you know it's one of the reasons why the slash movie pretty much died in the late 80s was because mm. the marketplace was flooded by by crap like this. Yes. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're going for, um, well, I think they're trying to create sort of well-rounded characters. So we have the two girls sitting in a room endlessly talking about how crap their boyfriends are. And it's like, it's like listening to, you know, a, a Lily Allen song or something, which it's is a movie equally, I've, equally as torturous, if you ask me. Yeah. It's a movie I've pretty much wiped from my memory, you know, aside from <laughs> the, the fantastic, that's a, there's a fan, uh, you know, it has yeah. fantastic, like when, when it was on, released on VHS it had like fantastic artwork but I don't even think mm. that's you know you can attribute that to the the makers behind the movie that's just the dis- distribution but is that the artwork it, with the woman crawling through the water and someone's inside exactly yes, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's fantastic and you know it's, you know you pick up stuff like that you're like ooh this looks so good and then you put it in and your mm. VCR just spits it right back out at you and yeah. spews <laughs> yeah <laughs> can, I, can I just add that uh you know, I've suffered from my art this week. I've watched four of my five films again this week just to make sure I hated them as much as I, I really, thought. That, that the only dedication. the only one I haven't watched again is my number one film because I don't own it and I never want to own it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, think I, I, I don't. Did you ones. go to such extremes? Uh, no, I didn't. No, I must admit I did. I did watch the initiation a few times um, to get myself yes. back into the mood for that. Um, but yeah, some of these ones, I, I I just knew that I hated them, and I mean that's kind of beauty for me. In, in some ways, with Hysteria Lives, I can go back and see what you know, yeah, you know what what I liked, why I hated them. Like. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, um, so I'm sorry, I've lost track. Are we number twos? Have we done uh, your Josephs? Josephs number two. Number two, yeah. All right, my number two is a real number two, and I'm sure it's number one for you. It's Rob Zombie's Halloween. Shock <gasps> horror, no. <laughs> <laughs> You mean yeah. the second coming of um, of Horror Christ or whatever? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything you love about you know John Carpenter's Halloween, it's like ignored, and it's like in favor. You know, they in favor of like white trash vulgarities and like a WWF approach to Michael Myers, and you know, whereas Michael Myers, you know, was like a motiveless like boogeyman and like the original. He's like here he's just a neglected child who likes to torture small animals, and he pitches a fit when he doesn't get to go trick or treating. And I always thought the movie was like a Leonard Skinner video with knives. And even then, that <laughs> sounds better than what Rob Zombie did with Halloween. But, uh, yeah, it's just – it's truly terrible. And I hate it. I really, really hate this movie. Well, I, I, I must I must admit that um, it is coming up on my list and it's not my number two. So I think that probably tells you where it's going to be. So I'm going to talk about it in, in a minute. How about you, Eric? Are you? Yes, um... it, it may be coming up on my list as well. Right. So, so I'll unless, talk you, about it then. unless you've got anything else I'm you sorry, want to say, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to upstage oh, you. I'm just this. trying to work out what what could possibly be worse unless it's Halloween I know. 2. But anyway, yeah. um, have you got anything else you want to add to um, that glowing review? Uh, I think I've said it all. It's <laughs> terrible. I mean, you know, I... I I went in with an open mind. I mean, anyone, if, you know, if they have the balls to remake Halloween, you know, you mm. have to go see it just to see what happens. And that, you know, the entire time I was in the movie theater, I was just sitting there and my jaw was like hanging out and mm. I wanted to leave. And I almost left a couple of times, but you know, I try not to leave movies if I can help it. You know, I paid for them. 
so I just sat there and I endured and I'll never do it again. Um, I hate this movie. That's all I can say. I hate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's a consensus there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if there's, I know there's a few Rob Zombie defenders on the, on the forum, so, um, I'm sure they might have something to say, but, um, I'm going to press ahead with my number two, which isn't Halloween, but it's of well, it's it's of that ilk. It's not quite of that ilk. It's about it's about the the time, um, and that is the Prom Night remake. Uh, now we talked about films where the the VCR will spit something out and disgust. I've only seen two thirds of this movie, and it's still so bad that it made my number two. Um, the reason they saw two thirds of it, I'm a bit like you, Joseph. I don't stop films unless something happens the house is burning down or, or something <laughs> you know i won't stop a film because um I, I think you need to have dedication especially if you're a fan of good and bad horror movies you've got to have a dedication to see certain things through to the end but the uh, the prom night remake it actually the dvd that i think we'd hired i don't own the film i'm glad to say um start started deteriorating by the two-thirds mark um and i couldn't watch the whole thing now I've been reading the um, Jamie Lee Curtis Screen Queen um, book by David Grove at the moment, um, and it is, it's, I've got mixed feelings about the book. It's, 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 it's a wealth of information. I kind of know lots and lots of stuff like you guys do about um, slasher movies, but it has a lot of stuff in there I didn't know about, um, about films, including Prom Night. Um, uh, but, and also Prom Night is, is, a, is a flawed film, the, the 1980 um, film, but it's a fun film. Um, but what they did with the Prom Night remake is they, they took the name and they took they systematically stripped every single bit of joy, of fun, of colour, whatever, out of that movie. Now, what I don't understand with these remakes, why not just remake the film? I'm not talking about doing a Gus Van Sant-type psycho remake of um, Frame by Frame. I mean, that's equally as pointless. But with, with this, it was so... Dull. Um, I mean, even you know the idea, you know the the classic bit in the in the original film where the severed head rolls down the um, the catwalk and everyone runs around screaming, bumping into each other. I mean, that that is so much fun. Um, in this film, the uh, the action and I use that word advisedly uh, it takes it takes part in a hotel above where the prom night um, is is happening. Now, hotels are obviously a very good um, location for slash movies. I mean, I mean, arguably The Shining isn't a slash movie, but arguably it is. Um, and it just goes to show what a good um, location it can be for a, um, a horror movie or a slash movie. But this film, it was just so boring, um, peppered by um, characters that were so vapid. I mean, essentially, it's you could have more fun watching Paint Dry than watching this movie. And I, you know, it's one of the few films. Any film that I've had where it's broken down, the tape snapped, the DVD's broken or whatever, I've, I've thought, I really want to find out what happens. And people couldn't pay me enough money to find out what happens at the end of this movie. And I'm just glad it didn't spurn a sequel, spawn a sequel, because it was fucking awful. So apologies for my French. But anyway, how about you guys? Have you had the pleasure? No, I've steered clear of Prom Night. I've heard all the but the uh, the bad publicity around it, so I, I didn't. But I, I think it was released. Was it a PG thirteen movie or something? It was, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I didn't see. I didn't think. I think I was a target audience being forty seven or whatever age I am. I agree with Justin. You know, this is a movie that you know it has a wealth of talent behind and in front of the camera, but they make this like criminally boring movie. Uh, characters you can't root for. Uh, they waste the setting. The killer's not scary, even though the actor playing the killer, he's a, you know, he's a decent actor. He's been in a few good things. Uh, it's just, it's just really boring. And, you know, it's, it doesn't have any of the charms of the original. You know, the original has, you know, Leslie Nielsen making an ass out of himself under a disco ball. This doesn't have that. Uh, <laughs> obviously it doesn't have Jamie Lee Curtis. Cause, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I agree with Justin. It's just terrible. Uh, I saw it once and I've pretty much, deemed to wipe it from my memory and I don't really feel like going back to revisit it so I'll just uh, leave it at that well I mean I, you know personally I mean you know I agree I mean it's I think it was a PG-13 film and it made a, quite a lot of money I can't remember how much but it was you know um, tens of millions of dollars I mean made, number made one at the box office on its opening weekend I believe yeah, absolutely. And I mean, just because a PG-13 doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a bad film. 
it's just suspense doesn't mean a higher rating. I mean, you know, uh, MPAA rating. Um, it, but it's just, you know, you just think. And, and also the, the thing about this film was that I think it was directed, I think I'm right in thinking directed or written by J.S. Cardone, who was the man behind The Slayer. Which See, is, that's what I was talking about. You know, you know, it has a lot of talent, but they just make this movie that just it's just so boring and there's nothing to it. Yeah. I mean, with a lot of these films, I mean, when you you know read about, but certainly modern films, I mean, um, a lot of the slash films that we love, a lot of them were made, um, you know, by interc- independent companies who did what they wanted to do. They didn't have, you know, people going, you know, demographic this, demographic that, watering things down. Whereas with these big budget teen orientated slash movies, and again, nothing wrong with being teen orientated, but. The problem is when you've got the money men saying, well, actually, we need Britney Snow in this and we need that happening, we need that happening. Don't take out all swearing, all sex, all violence. And then you're ended up with a husk of a movie. Um, and so it's, you know, again, it's a cardinal sin. As, as far as I'm concerned, is a boring slasher movie is a slasher movie I don't want to watch. So that's my number two. And I think we're coming on to the glorious number ones, the top of the yes. card. So um, is it, Eric, are you first? Yes, uh, my number one, as we've given away already, is Rob Zombie's Halloween. Mm. Um, I have many issues with this. Uh, just uh, Joseph has discussed many of them, but um, I just think the what Joseph said at the top of the show about modern slashers being populated with really obnoxious, horrible, unlikable characters, never is this more true than this film. And I think the biggest thing they get wrong in the remake is making Laurie the most horrible individual that you want to see get killed. And in Halloween 2, I want to see her get killed even more brutally. I wanted to see her decapitated. And that's not the way I felt when I saw Jamie Lee Curtis in the same role back in the 70s and early 80s. And I think they go for the... They go for the easy route. It's like Michael Myers became a psycho because he was bullied at school and his mother and father were sort of these redneck um, losers who beat him. You know, it's the same old cliche and it's the same thing they did with, with um, you know, explaining Freddy in Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. And they, I think they kind of imply it with Jason in some of the later Friday the 13th sequels. Um, oh, it's just hideous. And... Um, the only reason it's Halloween and not Halloween 2 well I, I should really put, have put both in my top 5 because I think they're two of the worst films I've ever seen but I thought I'd just, I'd just pick on one you know let them off easy I'm not a Rob Zombie fan at all I saw House of a Thousand Corpses and um, Devil's Rejects wasn't pushed on either of them I have to say um, and I thought Halloween was rubbish yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it kind of makes sense if I, if uh, if you don't mind me, Joseph, coming in here and we we'll do yours as last, because obviously yours is a mystery one. Um, is that okay with you, Joseph? Yeah, go ahead, man. Yeah. That's fine well, it's me. only because I'm um, just following on what Eric said about Halloween. I mean, both of you said pretty much what I what I think, and then it's no secret that Halloween is probably my favourite ever film of all time. Um, and there, there's a, you know, the one thing I've, I will give to Rob Zombie is he didn't do the Gus Van Sant route, which was basically just remaking Halloween shot for shot. Having said that, if he had, it probably have been more fun. Um, the thing that kind of, um, uh, you know, got got me was that I remember at the time hearing how awful it was and thinking, well, you know, again to give to give this man this props, um, as as the singer Nick Cave says, if you're going to do a cover version, you need to get a good cover version. You need to get inside the song, destroy it from the inside out. And that's what Rob Zombie has done with Halloween. But unfortunately, in such a ham-fisted, wrong, um, you know, wrong on every single level, he took something that was artful, graceful, scary, um, relevant, and turned it into a cartoon um, with the subtlety of, a, of, you know, like a forklift truck. I mean, it is just, just awful, awful. As, as Eric was saying, populated by people you don't, you don't like. Um, and again, reading, coming back to uh, David Grove's books about Jamie Lee Curtis, and she said that um, she had loads of problems worrying about if people liked her, she didn't think she was pretty, and all this, all these kind of things. But she saw when she, the reason they picked her, and they couldn't really work out why they picked her for this film, because Jamie Lee, because um, Laurie Strode was um, needed to be vulnerable and for the audience to care about her and want to protect her. Um, and she said when she saw the film, people were shouting at her character, they wanted her to survive. Whereas in this film, like you said, um, Eric, I wanted her dead. You know, I just wanted it to be the quickest slash movie in, in you know, mm. ever made. Uh, Michael Myers to kill her. Um, 
And this whole idea that coming in and demystifying Michael Myers, again, that's the whole point. He's the shape. He's the boogeyman. Um, you know, one of the things that bugs me about the, the Halloween films, when people always going on about how Halloween is in a supernatural film, of course, Halloween is a supernatural film. Um, and all the stuff about um, druids and all these kind of things may not have been um, in the original script, but it's certainly in the 1979 novelization by, I think it's Dan, Dan Curtis, um, and so there's always been this mysticism, um, you know, Michael Myers is, is um, you know, there's mystery about him. But by saying that Michael Myers, his turning into a psycho can be excused by having a bad childhood is, one, is offensive to people who have, don't have very good childhoods. Not everyone turns into a mass killer. Um, and also it's lazy, um, it's juvenile, and it's, it's just a pile of crap, really. Um, mm. And so what can I say? I you know, hate, hate, hate that film. I haven't watched a sequel. I don't think I can ever bring myself to watch a sequel, apart from maybe seeing um, his wife on a horse. Um, I hear that happens, I don't know. That almost <laughs> makes me want to see it to see how bad it could be. But ultimately, um, he really just fucked over the Halloween series. I, I like some of the sequels, but... I think he just basically ground that film into the ground um, and Rob Zombie, fuck you. Anyway. It's even, it's, even, <laughs> it's even worse than Halloween 6. And, you know, it takes a lot for me to say statements like that. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, what, what more can be said about that film? Um, and, and the thing that I, you know, I think is, is very, you know, upsets me is it made so much money at the box office. Well, I can I contributed to that, Justin. I'm afraid because I went to see it twice. Yeah, so did I. I didn't see it twice, but you know, I I, I was my well. I went to see it once on my own accord. Then I was dragged to it a second time by a friend. Actually, incidentally, the same friend who made me watch Detour. Blimey! Um, so so I, I I contributed twenty euro really, to that fund. Really, I really really <laughs> hope this guy's not. Here. No. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, um, I mean, Rob Zombie, I'm sure he's a lovely guy. Um, as they say, sometimes fans don't make good movies. Um, and uh, his heart's in the right place. It's just his brain. It is. He does come it. across as... I've, I've watched the behind-the-scenes documentary of uh, Devil's Rejects, and he does come across as sort of a genuine guy, and he's mm, sure doing he's, his best. His films just aren't for me. Yeah, same here. I mean, there's an audience for them. And let's face it, we are probably, you know, uh, not exactly old gits, but we're certainly getting that way. And yeah, what, we are. What's, what's going to, you know, what, um, you know, emos or whatever the young people are these days. I sound like I should be sucking a word as original. Um, <laughs> um, what, you know, what are their, you know, we can't second guess what they would like. But ultimately, I can't imagine anyone with an out. I mean, I can imagine a 15 year old sitting there in a Metallica T-shirt might like it. Just in the same mm -hmm. way as back in the day with Fangoria, it used to be, you know, um, heavy metals, fantastic, you know, Halloween forever, Friday the 13th rules, you know, that oh, kind of yeah. stuff. But, it, you know, for anyone with an ounce of um, taste or maturity or even, you know, a love of cheesiness and campiness and fun, it's just not for not for them. So, um, so yeah. So, anyway, um, that's our love letter to Rob Zombie. Um, let's finish on uh, Joseph's and his mystery number one. All right, here we go. Um, the worst slasher film I've ever seen is a movie from 1992. Uh, no one's seen it. Well, actually, people have seen it, but it's called The Weekend It Lives. And actually, it wasn't released until 2002 as Axum. So Ooh. my number one is a movie called Axum. Mm. All right. <laughs> this movie single-handedly makes a mockery of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, it's basically, you know, about a bunch of... Uh, uh, not to sound racist here, it's a bunch of black people who got together with $650 and they uh, do a lot of break dancing, dressing like DJ Jazzy Jeff, and they go off to the woods and, you know, somebody comes around killing them. You know, it sounds pretty good, but this movie is done. Think of Savage Water, like someone filmed Savage Water, held it under a mud pit for like two hours and then put put it on the projector. This is what Axum is. It's basically... Mm -hmm the most inept movie I've ever seen. The sound quality is like... <laughs> that's what, you know, when someone's talking... You mean like this podcast? Like. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, like I said, there's like a lengthy scene. I think it's like 15 or 20 minutes long to pad out the running time. It's basically a bunch of people breakdancing on the street. Uh, the video quality shifts violently through a lot, like granny to even grannier. Mm. And, you know, like I said, if you can hear any of the dialogue, like... You know, you have better hearing than I do, but 
obviously this is the worst movie I've ever seen, and I think a few people on the forum can attest to that. Have you, either of you seen it? I haven't I seen have, it. No, I haven't seen it, but I am um, intrigued by the breakdancing elements. Yeah, that does sound, 20 minutes, so, you know. That's a, that's a trouble, isn't it? Sometimes when you're talking about or writing out a really bad um, horror movie, slash movie, um, and when you talk about things, it, you can't help but, like, for being Eric, to always sitting there thinking, ooh, he's got breakdancing. Oh, that must be, you know, it's quite fun. But you know the truth, the, the black <laughs> heart of this movie, um, that it hasn't got a heart at all. I mean, it's interesting, actually, with the... Um, uh, where, the, where the slash movie after Scream um, splintered and went into lots of different directions, um, and you've got like you've got gay slash movies, lesbian slash movies, urban slash movies. You've got all these different types of things that, that came out, and some of them are great, and some of them aren't so great. And I think there's actually quite a few. Um, I think it's Holler and Holler and I'll. Oh, I think it's called Holler or Holler and I'll Scream or. Um, and there's quite a few black sort of urban slasher movies. Um, most of them I've seen are pretty pretty bad, to be honest, and I haven't seen that many. And I must count my blessings, I haven't seen Axum. Um, and it's probably not one I'm going to rush out to see, to be honest, Joseph. Oh, boy. Yeah. I hope, I certainly hope not. It's just, it is. It's, it's it is an definitely worse than it's Halloween. It's an abomination. Yeah, is it worse oh, than yeah. Halloween? Ooh. Well. Now, well. I would say, you know, Halloween, Rob Zombie's Halloween, you know, uh, it's terrible, obviously, but, you know, there's some talent put into it, I guess you could say, but this True. is just, you know, is that the case this is basically a bunch of people getting a really cheap camcorder. It was actually made for $650, and I mean, what more can you say about it? There's a, you know, those uh, opening scrolls on movies, like, you know, like Star Wars has one, mm. you know, it has text. Well, this one has, you know, opening text, and uh, now let me read this to you. It's it's really, it's really badly done, like the grammar, so it's, it's kind of hilarious. It, you have to read it. You know, hearing it, it's not as funny, but yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll try. It says, um, on a cold winter night in 1990, Mr. Mason, a mean and cruel townsman, left his job for home. After arriving home, he took a shotgun and killed his wife and kids. You know, so far, so good. Mm. Then is mean man, not then this mean man, then is mean man killed himself. And then it says, when the police arrived, they only found the bodies of his wife, daughter, and younger son. His mentally ill son, Harry, was not ever found. Was not was never found. Not ever found. Legend has it he will return in 13 years to revenge his family deaths. Not avenge his family's death. Revenge his family deaths. Oh dear. So, so that $650 <laughs> didn't go on, on proofreading, did it, by the sound of it? Yeah. Um, you know, whoever made this movie, you know, obviously wasn't hooked on phonics or anything, so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of—it's just think, terrible. It's awful. I mean, if you—if you really want to see the worst movie, I'm telling you, this is it. If you can sit through it, you are a bigger man than I am. And well, put it this way: it's not going to be on. Um, be watching it tonight, but I think. I think hopefully people out there, whether you agree with us or don't agree with us, um, and if you don't, I mean, we we, had, we didn't talk about it last time, but um, we're not sure how many people are listening to this podcast. Say so it may be just our grandmothers. I don't know. Might be a few more people. But if my you grandmother's do, dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> from, so are mine. So, so are mine. It's from the other side. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how few people are listening. We're actually having to um, get a uh, you know hotline to God. Um, but. If, if people are listening and you don't agree with what we're saying or you do agree with us, then drop us a line either through the, um, the Body Count Continues forums. Um, just Google Body Count Continues um, and you'll find that all through Hysteria Lives um, and just drop us an email and just let us know, you know what you think. If, you, if, you will, if you're lucky um, or unlucky, we'll read out um, what you say online. And of course, now we're setting ourselves up for a fail here because no one's going to write in because probably no one's listening. But we'll see. So hopefully they are. Or, or the one person we don't want to write in will, and I won't mention any names, but that's usually how it goes. What, Rob Zombie? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rob Zombie? George yeah. Bush. No, okay. He's listening, I know. He's listening. He's listening. <laughs> well, yeah, but what, the good thing is what we have, we've had a whole big, big vat of crap, and now we're going to have a nice cheese topping. And Eric, you're going to um, talk us through it and we're going to have a discussion yep. about this 1983 slasher movie. Now, The Initiation is a film that uh, bypassed me on its initial release in the 80s. It wasn't one that was generally available, so I didn't see it until Anchor Bay brought it out in 2002 on DVD. And I have to say, I was really, really pleasantly surprised with it because I thought being 84, 83, 84 vintage, I thought it might be a bit uh, bland. But uh, I think it really has a nice mix of Dawn of the Dead 
and in particular, Happy Birthday to Me, I think we've all spotted that connection. Because you've got, for instance, you've got the character of Kelly, played by Daphne Zuniga in one of her earliest roles. Not her first role, because she was in Pranks, uh, a.k.a. The Dawn of the Drip Blood before this. Um, she, her character has that um, fragmented memory that Ginny character had in Happy Birthday to Me. She also is kind of a red herring throughout the film. There are scenes where Kelly looks into a mirror and she sort of becomes sort of blank and almost trance-like. Uh, I think they're possibly setting her up as maybe the killer. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the uh, twist ending, which is pure happy birthday to me. Not uh, Probably not as extremely ridiculous, but certainly up there. Um, it's quite gory, actually. I was quite surprised. Um, now, the version you saw, Justin, in the 80s, I didn't see it, as I said, uh, was trimmed. I've got details of what was cut out here. I can talk about that in a second. Um, and it's got elements of cheese as well, of course. I mean, there are some fantastic outfits in it being the mid-80s. Uh, in particular, Marsha has this pink blouse that um, hmm, would, would, would be well at home in Sorority House Massacre, let's just say that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's a film I really, really like. What do you think about it, Justin? Um, it's funny, actually, look back at my review, uh, I did, um, and go, think Yeah, it was, it was harsh. It was quite harsh, yes, it was. Um, I mean, a lot of the reviews I, I wrote, um, on Hysteria Lives, the earlier ones, when I picked the kind of the ones I had access to, um, I mean, some of them are, well, how can I say, you know, pretty bad, um, and um, and also I kind of had a, had a real kind of difficulty working out how to judge films because I loved cheesy slasher movies, but I was trying to measure them against like Halloween and A Nightmare on Elm Street. And then I kind of realised actually in some ways that's a bit of a mistake because it should be really um, measured on the ent- entertainment um, uh, sort of uh, quota. Uh, and I watched um, the, the initiation again. I've watched it probably four or five times um, um, and as Eric was saying, I mean, you come to it in a minute, talking about the um, the UK release, which I was thinking it was on CIC video in the UK, which had pretty much every bit of gore cut out of it. Um, I really liked it. I really thought it was good fun. It was it was cheesy, um, creepy, had a few scary bits in it. Well, not really scary, but a little bit scary. Um, and I think just before we go on, I think we'll say, I think we do have to probably spoil it to talk about the ending just in the same way as Happy Birthday to Me um mm-hmm. is uh we we spoiled it last time so if you if you don't want this spoil then stop listening now and come back to it once you've seen it um but i think um uh, what about you joseph what's your what are your views on this film oh i love the initiation um this is a movie i saw you know probably 10 or 15 years ago i rented it from a place called movie gallery and um you know I think the lurid cover art kind of drew me in. It had the hand and the candle, and, and yes, I was going to talk about that. I mean, how did you uh, get away with that? If you if you look at the if you look at the box art, it almost looks like it almost looks pornographic. Mm, but you know, it was in the horror section, yeah. and I really like the, the artwork. It's the dripping wax that does this. Yeah. Well, and, and the hand, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, very, very um, low so, you know, body. Yeah. <laughs> I rented it, and you know, the first fifteen minutes, you know, I was pretty much into it. You know, it was a little slow, but you know them all you know there's like death a death here a death there you know all the characters are really likable uh there's lots of cheesy stuff to like you know the fashions the outfits the hairstyles and then you know outside the mall you have this uh i'm going to quote justin here and in his review he talks about uh the glamorous assistant with the big glasses (laughs) yes Uh, you remember if i'm talking about justin yes Um, yes. you have that and then you also sorry go ahead so I was just going to say, her name is, uh, the, well, the actress's name is Joy Jones, and she's now uh, Joy Tipping, and she, I was in touch with her during the week. Now, unfortunately, she hasn't got back to me in time for the podcast, but I do know that uh, she was, that was her only screen credit. She's a journalist now, and she has written some books uh, that horror fans might like, including one called Haunted City, A Guide to New Orleans for Anne Rice fans. Mm-hmm. And of course, she uses a third name there, Joy Dickinson. But uh, you've been in contact with some uh, of the cast, haven't you, Justin? I have. I have been uh, doing my usual stalking through Facebook. 
Um, and I managed to get in touch with um, a couple of people. The um, one woman who played Marsha with the the beautiful um, pink pullover you were talking about uh, yes. in such in such <laughs> enthusiastic tones, uh, Eric. Uh, Marilyn Kagan, who um, I believe is now a psychologist, uh, and um, she said uh, she went, "Oh, Facebook! Um, it's amazing what it throws up." As in me i you know comparing me to vomit but anyway um she sort of said that um and so she was going to get back to me but she's a psychologist now and she's she's kind of psychology major i think in the film she does talk about psychology a bit um yeah. and i really like that character she's going she's writing a paper on the effects of the soap opera or something she says that's right at that's one right. stage yeah because she's she's again it's another person that is um hopefully going to get back to us at some point and we can always feed back either on the on the website or again, again on here. Um, but she said, "Oh, see if I can remember what it was like um, running my fanny off around um, a uh, shopping mall in Dallas." And of course, fanny means something different yes, in the UK. It does. But we won't. We won't go there. Um, the other person um, I got in contact. I really want to get in contact with the woman who played Megan, who was the bitchy um, sorority sister. And, mm. and I think I did track her down, but she's not got back to me. Maybe she doesn't want to be known for this. I don't know. But one of the characters who I did chat through email with was Peter Maloff, who plays Andy, who has that great scene when he goes into the girl's bedroom dressed in a bizarre cross between some S&M Tarzan outfit. Um, <laughs> like like something Martin Gore would wear for Depeche Mode. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, Although I think his, 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 the better of his two outfits is the um, leopard print underpants he wears later on. Yes. Are you still yeah. talking yeah. about Martin Gore? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're now talking about <laughs> Andy. <not. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the good. I mean the good thing of Peter Maloff, he seems to be. Um, he seems to uh, you know look back on it quite fondly. I think uh, like a lot of these people we speak to seem to quite enjoy it. And he was really thrilled to work on this movie. Um, and he said that the, the night shoots were pretty tough. And he said they spent ages trying to spot um, topless girls on roller skates um, going past. And I don't remember any topless girls on roller skates in that film. No, there is um, the character of. Alison goes around on roller skates and oh, she has her yeah, top off, right. but not at the same time. Yes, Tyler, Tyler yeah. Hunter. Is it Hunter or is it Hunter Tyler? Hunter Tyler or something, yeah. Tyler, that's Although she, she uses a different name in the film. She's Deborah something. And Yeah, that's right. And for nudity fans, um, apparently that's the only time she's um, got them out, basically, um, as far as I can know. And I did write to her, and again, she's not someone who got back to me. Um, she is a born-again Christian, I think, so oh, she might she? be trying to erase the initiation off her CV. Oh, that's a shame. That's a shame. Yeah. Um, and again, I wrote to uh, Daphne as well, um, <laughs> hear back from her. Um, I don't sure know she's why. writing back as we speak. Sorry? Yeah. I said, I'm sure she's writing you back right, right as we're yeah. recording this. Well, can I share my, my favourite bit of acting from her? Because I love this film and I love... Um, can we just talk about the ending a little bit about the... Yeah. Um, do you want to talk... <laughs> Eric, do you want to tell us what, who the well, killer is? Well, it turns out that the killer is um, Daphne Zuniga's twin sister that she didn't know she had, mm. um, who comes to the shopping mall dressed exactly the same as Daphne Zuniga and because she, apparently she's been stalking her and so... Uh, as people encounter her, they go, oh, it's you. You know, the usual slasher yeah. movie, Chestnut. Uh, turns out that she, I think she, I think what we're supposed to believe is she is the girl from the dream sequence. She's the one who stabs her father in the leg. Uh, and, and Daphne Zuniga kind of has this, um, I don't know, maybe a, a twin psychic thing. And that's why she's having this dream all the time. That's the impression I get. But uh, anyway, they come face to face in the mall. Um, we know which one is evil. Uh, Daphne and which one's good Daphne because evil Daphne is very very pale like a goth um, she hasn't got any lip balm on has she by the look of it I think that's <laughs> no <laughs> either yeah she actually yeah. Yeah, she kind of reminded me of um, Linda Blair and the Exorcist in the early stages of her mm. possession mm. Um, and also she's uh, the evil twin is played by a very very bad body double in a wig for the scenes where the two of them have to be on screen at the same time I didn't think that was too bad yeah. actually I was spot trying Did to you? stop that I thought I, it was okay. uh, uh, I maybe if you freeze frame it you'll, you'll yeah, see what I mean would, yeah. was it a man? <laughs> it is very bad yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Um, but no I was just going to say I mean I just coming back to um, Daphne I mean as you, you said earlier she's um, of course it, they say this film is introducing Daphne Zuniga and it's kind of um, or Zun is it Zuniga or is it, I mean not I say Zuniga but I'm not sure yeah. she's not somebody that you see mentioned a lot on television no. so. but the funny the funny thing with this is that obviously she was she had a head run over by a car in the dormitory of blood aka pranks in 1981 
And you would think, okay, some actresses might not want that on their resume. So what do they do? They introduce themselves with a cheesy slasher movie, um, yeah. which is a bizarre kind of thing. <laughs> but I thought she was pretty good in this. She's quite fun. But I did love my the best bit of um, bad acting, I thought, was when she's being chased by her t- evil twin. And she says, I've got this little bit of sound clip here. And it sounds like, um, well, let's play it. This is the bit. Yeah, it always I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, sounds, that's the bit I thought you meant. <laughs> it, it sounds like someone, her sister's chasing her, pulling her pigtails in a um, that's exactly, in a, that's in a playground. Now, in, Not, fair, in fairness, I think that was the problem with the script. I mean, you, you don't turn around to the psycho that's chasing you and go, leave me alone. They're not like, oh, leave me alone. It's almost like, like mommy, kind of like, yeah. she won't let me play with her Barbie doll. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> She's just seen all her friends, all pretty much the whole of her college, you know, found, cut up. So, so, certainly the um, Hunter Tylo, whose kind of um, death scene is actually very prolonged and very bloody. She's seen them all being murdered and rather than screaming and going out of her mind, she's just like, oh, leave me alone. You know, it's just kind of bizarre <laughs> kind of thing. Um, speaking, speaking of Alison's prolonged death, that was one of the things that was uh, severely truncated yeah. for the UK VHS release in 1986 yeah. um, because I think it, the the murder happens and is intercut with the sex scene and the, the sex and violence put together like that was a big no-no back in the day. Uh, the other yeah. scenes that were truncated were anything involved in the garden fork because easily obtainable household equipment that can be used as murder weapons was another big bugbear of the BBFC at the time. So like the Clue Goolidge are getting killed, uh, the nurse getting killed and Alison then getting stabbed. They were the three main scenes that got cut uh, from the film back in 86. Um, apparently it's been released over here on DVD since, but I've never seen it. I bought the, I bought the US release now myself. Right. Because I've been all, thinking... all cuts were, um, were waived and it's back to full length now apparently. No, I saw that. I mean, I kept on thinking, you know, the whole, the weird thing. I mean, um, you know, the thing of Joseph, you're, it didn't get cut in, in the US. I mean, it's quite gory, isn't it? I mean, do you think, I mean, when you watch it now, Joseph, I mean, do you say, are you surprised that it got, got passed for an R rating? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a lot of blood, a lot of, you know, outlandish death scenes, you know. Mm. Uh, it wasn't like Happy Birthday to me, you know, where it got cut a lot, you know. Mm. Because I, I did wonder, actually, because um, I think back in the midst of time, uh, there, were, there was always rumours about certain films that got um, passed with an R rating, and then they just bunged the film out um, uncut with an R stuck on this it. This one seemed to escape uh, scrutinization. Um, mm. I don't know how, but, you know. But it, it did. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's quite gory in places. Well, I thought, mm. especially the with the Hunter Tylo's um, death scene, I mean, that is, right. you know, it's very bloody and it goes on and on and on, which for most slasher movies, you don't get that kind of, um, certainly, you know, classic era ones. They're not lingering in the kind of mm. death scenes. They tend to be quite quick, even in Friday the 13th, they're, even though they're very graphic. Um, and the burning, it's, there's very much quick cuts. And um, so it's not that kind of gloating. Well, it's not really gloating, but it was, it was yeah, I was surprised how, how gory that was. Um, and just going back to what you're talking about, Joseph, about the BBFC, and this is one of the big things, was that um, they didn't like if you could, um, uh, you know, you could sort of uh, imitate something. And I was just thinking, with the, the garden trowel, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you're going to take out on the town with you for a fight, is a garden trowel. <laughs> or are you going to be a little, a little old lady who watches the initiation with, her, with their grandchildren and then going out planting daffodils and then going on a killing spree? <laughs> It's, it's just not that likely, is it? But this was back in the 80s, and obviously they had uh, yeah. things. And, of course, it never got a cinema release here. Um, this, I think this was uh, said in um, when I was doing Teenage Wasteland, I was looking at this, and I think this was released right at the end of 1984. And what I said was a good symmetry about this was that the fact is, obviously, um, we talked about, um, uh, you know, Clue being in it, but also uh, Vera Miles, who, of course, played Marion mm. Crane's sister in Psycho. So it has a kind of um, symmetry that you've got Vera Miles appeared in Psycho, and then she appeared in the initi- initiation. But as I said in the book, um, Hitchcock didn't have a scene with um, someone dressed as a giant penis, but that oh, yes. might have made Psycho even better. <laughs> Who knows? Or a new wave band with an incredibly hyperactive keyboard player. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. And I do. Yeah, either, to, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, go on, Joseph. Oh, I was just going to say, did either of you guess the ending? No, um, I did. Uh, I think the only reason I did is because the entire time, you know, she keeps having this dream. It's from her point of view, and you know, in most dreams. You know, it's yeah. always from your point of view. So why are you seeing yourself 
stab mm-hmm. someone. So when I sure. saw that, I'm like, I get, I bet she has a twin sister. And then later in the film, uh, they're at the asylum, and there's before the breakout, you actually see Daphne Zuniga's character, uh, her twin sister character. You can see her for like a split second standing amongst the crowd. Right. And I picked it up, and I said, yeah. I knew it, oh, I knew can it. You, can I you actually it. see her face, yeah? Yes, you can see everything. Because right, yeah. okay. there is a close-up of somebody clenching their fist and banging their fist Go against back, their uh, side. Watch the asylum scenes. Uh, it's really quick, but you mm. can see her standing in the crowd. Speaking of the asylum scenes, Justin, don't you have some information about, wasn't there originally a... a a uh, different director assigned to this film. I mean, it is directed by Larry Stewart, but he was brought on sort of mid-shoot, That's I believe. That's right, yeah. The, um, uh, Peter Maloff, um, and also the guy, uh, I can't remember, the, one of the other guys, the one who got the um, his throat cut, um, he, someone sent me some answers that they got, um, and he's talking about this, that there was a different um, director who they said was like Roman Polanski, um, which I find quite hard to believe that Roman Polanski would uh, direct something like The Initiation. Obviously, it wasn't <laughs> Roman Polanski. Um, from what we've been able to dig up, I mean, it seems like his name is uh, Peter Crane, who was an English director who was hired um, and possibly filmed the uh, sanitarium scenes and also the the scenes um, with Vera Miles in the, the mansion. Uh, now, apparently, he went over budget and over time and was, was sacked. And um, Larry Stewart is kind of a journeyman who um, had done lots of TV. But bizarrely, um, uh, Peter Crane, um, it wasn't making art house movies. If it is the same guy, um, he was he was doing things like episodes of The Love Boat and, um, and um, uh, Matt Houston and things like that. So, so I'm not quite sure. There's obviously more story there. But some of the actors, they said they were hired by this English director um, and um, he was fired, and so when they started work, they started work with this this new guy. Um, so there's it's, with a lot of these films, there's quite a lot of interesting uh, stuff behind them. And another another thing that I found um, about this was that um, you know, with Eric, you were talking about the the burn scene at the beginning where the the guy gets burned. Um, I found a bit in Variety that said that they actually used that scene. Um, as an educa- educational guideline um, to the safety committees of the actor and directors guilds, um, and that's the only bit I saw. So it either went very, very well or very, very badly. Um, I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what what happened with that. Um, the the only other thing, well, one of the other things to say about the film was I don't think it's particularly successful. Um, when it was released, it was released after I think Night on Elm Street. So although it had this slight kind of dream stuff going on as well. Um, it was filmed in 1983 and obviously sat on the shelf. It was released by New World. Um, uh, it was produced as an independent um, film in Dallas. Um, from what I can see, it didn't make a huge amount of money, so which is probably why it didn't, you know, end up on this um, side of the the Atlantic. Um, but um, uh, what, any other things about the initiation, guys? What's it? Is that a yes that or be, no? That would be it. Well, I'll, I'll, the only other, the only other um, fantastically cheesy moment, and it's the cherry on top of the cake as far as I'm concerned, is that fantastic saxophone mus- uh, instrumental that plays over the end credits. Mm. It's it's like Kenny G at his at his most brilliant. Absolutely. I've got a little bit. When we when we um, finish this, I've got some of the um, the song, the, the band that was playing, which I didn't actually look up what their names were. And of course... Oh, I did, but it's completely gone out of my head now. But they have... Yeah, an interesting name as far as I can remember. Well, that's, that's I wanted good... to sorry, go on, Joseph. During the scene, I wanted to say during the scenes where, uh, you know, Daphne's go- undergoing the therapy, and the you know he's trying to uh, basically basically he's trying to hypnotize her, or, mm. you know, so she can remember her her past. Mm. I, I just wanted to you know point out some of the acting in that scene. Oh yeah, always thought it was hilarious. Mommy, no. <laughs> and then she's like, "It's not fair." I always thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's a lovely. I mean, she actually, I mean, to give her a props, um, I mean, Daphne comes good. I mean, this is uh, just another sound clip here from the ending, which we heard actually at the beginning. Um, I put it in with some of the music, but uh, this is kind of um, just talk a little bit about Evil Twins in a second, but here's a little sound clip. Good night, sister darling. <laughs> Now that's again some prime acting there, um, mm. and I love it. That's a kind of that's a kind of um, getting behind stuff, you know, having a having some real fun with it. Um, I was trying to think back of evil twin movies, um, and the the other one that comes to mind is uh, Nightmare at Shadow Woods or Blood Rage, uh, where you have the evil male twins. Um, and um, Rocktober Blood, which you talked about last week. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, the identical twins. Can you think of any other 
uh, films because it's such a hoary cliche, isn't it? The the insane twin, but there's not actually that many films using that. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I can't <laughs> think of anything off the top of my head. Mm. No, um, I can't. I can't. I can't. I mean, the two the, the two killers at the end of Hell Night aren't twins, are they? Okay, no, there's another siblings. one. It's yeah. There's another one. It's not really a twin. Uh, if I can remember correctly, it's not really even a slasher movie, but it has a lot of the same thing. It's a movie called uh, Scissors from 1991. It's got Sharon, Sharon Stone, Stone and uh, yeah. I think it's Steve Railsback or Ronnie Cox. I can't remember. Mm. Uh, there are evil twins in this, but it turns out at the end that they're really not twins. It's just one person pretending to be twins. Mm. Well, it's, I mean, that's the thing is that they probably they were turning the kind of evil twin thing on their head, weren't they? Um, mm-hmm. I wonder with like the initiation and when it was written and whether or not they thought the evil twin was a bit of a you know uh, you know hoary plot device. Um, I mean the thing is in the ending of Scream Three, isn't it? It's the whole. Am I right? I think I've seen it for ages, but like the brother sister thing where you kind of like bringing the kind of evil sibling into in, into it. Um, and um, I, you know, I just looking back and looking talking about all the really crappy films that we have earlier. The, the initiation is just like a good time uh, slasher movie. My only criticism, I kind of guess of it, is that the last half of it is great. I mean, they um, they just talking a little bit about how they shot the film because it was in um, I think it's, it's it's shot in Dallas Fort Worth, um, and it was not actually a shopping mall. It was like a um, it was a wholesalers I think, and they had it from um, seven o'clock in the evening till six o'clock in the morning, um, and so it was a bit like with Dawn of the Dead where they filmed it where everyone was out. Um, but they they had to be out by seven o'clock in the morning, and apparently um, the guy who and name escapes me, the guy who had his throat cut, um, he said that uh, he, which is pretty good, like um, a sort of effect of him lying there with his throat cut. But he said that they couldn't get it to stick properly, and they were basically the keys were in the lock, so they were about to open, and they had to shoot him lying there. Um, and the one shot, and if you notice, the same shot is used a couple of times in the film. Um, because they couldn't take extra shots of him him lying there, uh, so he said said it was quite creepy but quite fun as well, and having this whole place. And I think it's quite you know I mean it's it's done in quite a cheesy way with all of the the shadows following them round with like the all the different weapons and stuff like that. But I think it's you know it's it's you know it's a good fun uh, slash movie. And if anything, if it's the last slash movie of the golden era from um, and you know closed in nineteen eighty four, it's it's certainly a better close to that period and certainly something like Splatter University which you know is, is the pins mm. as far as I'm concerned um, well I think the uh, big part of the success of the film is the location it's I mean it's a stunning looking building and they really utilize it quite well yeah. um I mean it is a, a terrifically fun film there is one scene that stands out though and I remember you were saying last week on your what the fuck moments about the ending of Girls Night Out being you know, out of tone with the rest of the film. Mm. The sequence where Marsha gets drunk and she admits to her friends that she was sexually abused when she was 12. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very well-played scene. The actress is very good in it. It, it mm. seems at odds with the rest of the film. I mean, I've, I've no problem with it being in there, but what did you think of it? Well, I, that's what I do, I, you know, love about these kind of films, because it's not the kind of thing you'd get in the Prom Night remake. Mm, exactly, you know, they, yeah. They wouldn't give that kind of spike. You wouldn't get those things that... Um, you know, for the kind of the, uh, between us, we've probably seen hundreds, not thousands, of slasher movies. You know, in these type of films, but sometimes you get those curveballs that you can be sitting there, you know, watching a film um, for all the cliches. And of course, these films are very, very cliched, and that's part of the reason we like them. You know, mm. the idea of the story being retold time and time again. It's it's popcorn horror. It's fun. But sometimes you get those little spikes which really do sort of take you aback. And again, that's that's one of them. Um, you know, you have to question, is it is it appropriate, I kind of guess, for a film of, of this um, nature? And But, I, you know, I mean, uh, that kind of stuff, anything that kind of raises it out of the norm, I think is, you know, mm. well, is I interesting. think that they successfully, like, Marshall's already a likeable character. And I think they make her, you know, very sympathetic with that scene. And you really don't want to see her die. I think which ultimately she does, like- yeah. I think we've come like full circle in this podcast because mm. you know it goes back to like the callousness of and like noxious characters like in the prom night remake. You know, mm. their big scene is like, "Oh, I can't find my diamond clutch." You know, and you know, mm. in the old slasher films, you know, they talk about human things that you know you can identify with and you can you know. Because even the character of Allison, who would you would expect to be kind of a nasty character because she has sort of that look. You know, she's really, really, really nice, very sympathetic. And I mean, again, if she was in a modern slasher, I'm sure she'd be very materialistic and self-centered and, you know, she'd probably be the first to go. 
Well, no, absolutely. And I do like, I mean, the other thing I liked about this film, uh, watching it, was the, the character, I can't remember the name, it's played by the actress Paula Knowles. Knowles. Um, she's the one that, one of the sorority sisters, who basically says, sod this, this is just stupid, I'm not getting involved. All right, yeah. And leaves the film. Um, I know she's she's used because she, I think they phone her later. But yeah, she's you know that's something that's quite believable, isn't it? You know, it, you could get that that kind of it, it's out of the left field rather than going along with everything. She actually mm. says, no, this is this is just really juvenile. I'm not going to get involved in it. So having those little um, um, you know sidewinders, I think is good. I mean, the only thing that I think is um, in in a shame is the the fact that um, Heidi um, uh, Joy's character doesn't turn up and it'd been great if she'd been the killer that would have been neat killer, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, if she actually, turned I up think that took her brilliant. glasses off and then sort that of you know and, she yeah, and had a mask killed on with her glasses. Yeah, she pulled her face off like at the end of Happy Birthday to Me and it was Daphne Z- Zuniga underneath or the other <laughs> way around it's um, her evil twin then she pulled her face off and it was Heidi underneath I, that would have been great that would be terrific yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun film, um, mm. and um, yeah, I asked one of the characters. I actually asked um, Peter Maloff. I said, "What's it like talking about a film? Were you expecting to talk about this film thirty years later?" And he said, "No. Why am I?" Um, <laughs> that's the goodest place to end it as anywhere. Because it's, you have a stalker on Facebook. That's exactly, why. exactly. Yeah. And I, I almost caught. I, I um, one of the people actually, Paula Nail's character. I kind of. I was looking at her photo and she looked like the woman, the actress, and she wrote back to me and said she's not, she's a veterinarian in California and it wasn't her at all. Um, but yeah, it just, it just, you know, it's just amazing in 30 years, well, these 30 years since the film or 28, 27 years since it's been filmed, you know, where these people are now um, and what they think about it, you know, is, and I just, I just find it fascinating. Um, and hopefully when we've got some more of these, uh, some of the interviews, we'll publish some of them. So if you're listening to this, you know, keep on the website to find out a bit more about what people thought about uh, making an initiation. So um, is there anything else you want to add, guys, or shall we wrap it up? I think that's it. Yeah. Before I wrap things yeah. up, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of spamming for my friend, uh, mm. my best friend, Nathan Johnson. He's got a new blog dedicated to slasher movies. It's, Very good uh, it is too. It's, it's called I Have an Axe to Grind. Mm. Um, it's at http axe2grindshorrors.blogspot.com. Uh, if anyone knows about slasher films as much as us, if not more, it's this guy. Uh, so check his his blog out. It's uh, Again, that is axe2grindshorrors at extragrindshorrors.blogspot.com uh, it's a really good new blog on slasher films and he does like he does kind of unusual stuff like talking about like the fifth victim in a slasher film or people he felt should have survived so uh, yeah check that out if you get a chance excellent we will do we might steal some of his <laughs> ideas for the podcast in the future as well which is always useful so um, so no thanks again guys um, I hope um, I've really enjoyed it and I hope uh, mm-hmm. people listening to it have enjoyed it and we'll well, you know, um, I think this could be a, a regular thing. And if there's if there's an interest out there, then you know, I'm certainly up for it. And I hope you guys would be to 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 doing it, doing some more. And we'll what we'll have to do is have a think about another film we want to dissect, um, and um, you know, we'll take it from there. So, uh, without further ado, um, I shall we shall leave. Um, I'm going to play out on um, a little bit of the music. Um, and this, of course, is one of the things, the great things um, uh, about the 80s slasher movie is a lot of those kind of dorm or college slashers is the party scenes. Um, and we didn't actually talk about the party scene, actually, do we? I love the bit where yeah. I think it's Megan, where she's drinking one green drink and one yes. yellow drink. And it's like, a, well, in this in this country, I don't know if you get it in um, in America, Joseph, but they, we have snake bite. Do you know what a snake bite is? Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have it in the States, but we use cider and lager, which gets you really pissed really quickly. Um, <laughs> I haven't had a snake bite for you know, many, many years, or mm. many, many hours. Um, but it's, you know, what I really like is that, that kind of, you know, fun. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> These, There's also, um, uh, one of the guys says he's invented a new dance called the body bag, but we never get to see it. And I'm intrigued to know what the body bag would look like, because I'm a, a dance enthusiast. <laughs> Well, absolutely, and, and who hasn't wanted to go to a um, fancy dress party? You're the guy who likes uh, giant penis. dirty, dirty dancing, right? I am the guy who likes dirty dancing. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, my secret is out. Secret is out. Okay. Yeah. Well, on that bomb. At least, at least, at least, I don't go to Spanish supermarkets looking for scat movies. Well, I didn't go looking for Ooh. it. The scat movie found me, Eric, as well. Burn. You know. I'm sure there's lots of other things that will we'll, we'll be outed in, in good time. Yes. But um, we've only just begun as the Carpenters, as Karen Carpenters once said, and, and um, get that sandwich away from me was something else she said. But anyway, ooh, ooh, um, ooh, okay. 
And so, um, thank you for listening, and we shall finish on a very small about, um, amount of this. But if I can find it, is the um, is the part of the the band. So, um, see you next time. Yeah.